that we wanted to spend our spring break down in Hollywood, California. One of our friend's father was the pastor of the church down there, so it made sense. We had a place to stay, and there would have been plenty to do, and we tried to do as much as we could. Perhaps the highlight of our trip, though, was the day that we got to be part of the studio audience at The Price is Right. And there we were, six of us, all in our row in our matching MLC t-shirts, and at the very beginning of the show, as Rod Roddy is calling all of the contestants to come on down, one of the names he called was our friend Jeff. So Jeff went down, and on the second game, he got closest to the actual retail price without going over uh, on a set of Oneida stemware. And so he got to get up on stage. And so there again, the camera is on us as we're cheering our friend on as he's on stage getting ready to play the grand game. The way that works is you start with $1, and there are a list of six everyday products that you have to guess which ones are below a certain amount. And each one you guess correctly, a zero is added to the one, and it, on it goes. A chance to win 10000 And so there again, we are on TV as we're shouting advice to our friend. And unfortunately, he listened to us. And he got the first one wrong, and he walked away with a dollar, and with the consoling words of Bob Barker, who told him, Jeffrey, I hope the rest of your life goes better than today. Now, it's kind of a, a sad ending to the story, but I think that's part of what makes it a cool story. It's part of the fun in telling that story, and that's why I told it to you, because it's a fun story to tell. It's a cool story. And I'm sure you have a cool story that you like to tell. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that your greatest achievement in life or the most amazing coincidence that's ever happened to you or the most fun you've ever had, it's not something that's known to you alone. It's something you like to share with people. It's a story you like to tell because it's a story worth hearing and it's a story worth telling. And that makes perfect sense. And that's the conclusion of our story from the book of Luke today. Jesus said to a man, go and tell everyone what God has done for you. It's a perfectly logical conclusion. It's exactly what you would expect to have happen, that this man would go and tell people what had happened to him, what God had done. Because it's a story worth telling, and it's a story worth hearing. But to understand how we got there, we need to go back to the beginning, don't we? Jesus and his disciples arrive in a region called the Gerasenes, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, across from the Sea of Galilee, from the region of Galilee. And I think you know what happened on that little boat trip from one side to the other. This was the time that a furious squall came up, and the disciples were fighting against the wind and the waves as they're trying to sail their boat across, trying to keep it from capsizing, and at one point they thought they were doomed. And Jesus is in the boat taking a nap. They wake him up and they cry out to him for help and Jesus stands up and he rebukes the wind and the waves and everything becomes perfectly calm and still. Right there, Jesus showed that he has power over everything. That even the forces of nature have to submit to him, to what he declares. And it is with this power that Jesus arrives there in the Gerasenes and he is immediately met by a man possessed by many demons. Legion was his name, because a Roman legion consisted of 3,000 to 6,000 troops, so it was a lot. And these demons approached Jesus as they occupied this man, and they talked to him. And right away in our text, you get an understanding, you get a feeling of the horror that was this man's life. He was cast out of the community. He's forced to live by himself in solitude. Forced to live in the tombs, places that were associated with the revulsion of death. He never wore any clothes, adding to his misery and his shame. We're told that he was often bound with chains and he was kept under guard, presumably so that when he went into a fit of madness, he wouldn't hurt somebody or hurt himself. But evidently, the demons gave him superhuman strength. He was able to, to break those chains, and he went off, excluded from the community. Other gospel writers, talking about this same, uh, same story, they tell us that he also cut himself with stones. Something I have to imagine the demons caused him to do just 
just so that they could enjoy the suffering that they were causing him. The level of wickedness and the level of contempt that these demons showed for mankind is staggering. The joy that they had in causing him pain is something that goes almost beyond our comprehension. These demons were truly evil and vile and wicked. And they wanted everyone to know that. They wanted their wickedness to be on display. They also wanted their power to be on display as they were able to, to do things that humans couldn't do, but also able to force that human being to do something he wouldn't normally do, to hurt himself, to bring shame upon himself. The demons wanted everyone to know just how powerful they were, and that there was nothing that this man could do about it, nothing he could do to stop these demons from doing what they did. And yet, as soon as Jesus stepped onto that shore on the Sea of Galilee, this man came running, and these demons cried out and begged him not to torture them. Falling to his knees, the man addressed Jesus as Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, but it wasn't an address of of honor or reverence shown by the demons. They weren't worshiping him. They hated him. But as much as they hated him, as much as they wanted to oppose him, they knew who he was, and they knew that they could not deny his power. And so for all of their treachery and their wickedness and all of the strength and power that they had, in the end, they could not do anything without say-so from Jesus. And so they begged him repeatedly not to torture them, not to send them to the abyss. They saw there was a herd of pigs nearby, and they asked Jesus to give them permission to go into that herd of pigs. And so Jesus did give them permission, but there again, you see, it wasn't any decision that they made. It wasn't a choice that they had. The decision belonged to Jesus. Jesus had the power to decide what they did. And it wasn't the other way around. And as much power as they exercised over this man, as much joy as they had in causing him pain, they knew that they were nothing compared to the power of Jesus. And that's an important thing for us to remember. Because so often the devil tempts us with that lie that there are simply some things Jesus cannot do. And again and again, he whispers in our ears that Jesus just isn't powerful enough for this or that. And so there are times that we face the, the tragedies, the difficulties of life, and, and there is the devil telling us it's because Jesus couldn't do anything to stop it. Your friend has cancer? It's because Jesus can't stop it. Your loved one has passed away? It's because Jesus didn't have the strength to do something about it. Your home was lost in a flood because the power of Jesus only goes so far. Your relationships are in shambles and your finances are a mess. Obviously, Jesus can't do anything about that either. And again and again, the devil speaks to us in this way. Again and again, he casts the shadows of doubt in our mind. And again and again, he comes to us with the greatest temptation, which is this. You are a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner, and there is no way that Jesus can forgive you. There is absolutely no way that Jesus can love you, because there's only so much that Jesus can do. This is the way the devil operates. This is the greatest temptation that he throws at us. Again, causing us to doubt God's promises, to doubt God's word, to doubt God's power. So that doubting him, we turn away from him. We focus on something else. The devil knows that when we turn from Jesus, that's when he has us. That's when he holds on to us, and that's what brings us to condemnation. And so we turn to the pages of Scripture where we are reminded there isn't anything that is too powerful for Jesus. The wind and the waves obeyed him. And these demons that possessed this poor man had to listen to him. 
No matter what tragedy strikes us, no matter what event happens in our lives that would cause us pain or sadness, there is nothing that happens outside of the powerful arm and the watchful eye of our Savior. There is nothing that happens in our lives that Jesus doesn't see or that Jesus doesn't have control over. And yes, certainly there will be times when the hardships and the pain and the sadness of this life will affect us and will touch us in a profound way. But even then, we know that Jesus is watching over us. Jesus is protecting us and guarding us and guiding us. At no time does he ever leave us. At no time are we in a situation that's just beyond his control or his power. And this is especially true when it comes to the problem of sin that we have in our lives. When we feel unloved or unlovable, that's when Jesus comes to us and says, even the sin that separates us from God, the sin that would condemn us, even that Jesus is too strong for. And in his power, he came to this world and he lived perfectly and then gave us that perfection and then took from us our sins so that by his power, he might die on the cross to offer his life as the sacrificial payment for that sin. That's the power that Jesus has. So now we stand before him holy and righteous. And then after he died, he rose again from the dead. Not even death which comes to us all, not even that, was too powerful for Christ. And in fact, death can only affect us if Jesus gives it permission, which Jesus does not. By his powerful resurrection, we too will have our own resurrection. This is the joy and the message of the gospel. It's a story worth hearing, isn't it? And a story worth telling. It makes us glad when we hear it. Sadly, that's not always the case. There in that region of the Gerasenes, Jesus healed this man possessed by demons completely. There he was, fully clothed, sitting at Jesus' feet in his right mind. And when the people heard about this, and when they heard about the pigs rushing into the water and drowning, when, they, when these things all happened, they came running to see for themselves. And they saw that everything they had heard was true. But they were afraid afraid of Jesus, afraid of the power that he has. And, and often that is the, the reaction to the, the message of the gospel, the good news. The good news is that we are freed from our sins by the power of Christ. And yet so often it's not met with acceptance. It's not met with joy. It's met with fear because, because then we have to come to grips with the reality that we are sinful. And we have to come to terms with the reality that there is nothing that we can do to change that sinfulness. Nothing we can do to save ourselves from it. And so we become afraid, afraid of Jesus because, because he's powerful and he could punish us. And so just like those people in the Gerasenes, we send him away. Go away from here, Jesus. I don't want that in my life. I don't want to be reminded of my sin. I don't want your judgment hanging over me. There again, we, we push him away and we turn away from him and rejecting his grace, we are condemned. And so we realize and it can only be by God's grace that anyone would hear the message of the gospel and receive it with joy and gladness the way that the man healed of demon possession did. He knew what Jesus had done for him. He knew how he had been healed. He understood fully the compassion that Jesus had for him in his life, how Jesus reached out to him and healed him. But more important, he knew that he was a child of God, that he was an heir of eternal life because of the grace that Jesus brought to him, the forgiveness of sins. That was the story of the gospel that the man had heard and experienced. And for that reason, he wanted to stay with Jesus. He wanted to, to follow him and, and continue to learn from him. The normal reaction, right? But Jesus actually bestowed on this man an even greater honor. Because Jesus was not allowed to stay there in the region of the Gerasenes. But the man who had been healed of his demon possession, he was. And so Jesus told him, go tell your story. Go home and tell people how much God has done for you. It truly is a great honor that Jesus would send this man as... It's his apostle. 
This happened even before Jesus sent out the 12 apostles two by two. Here was this man with a commission from Jesus Christ to go into his town and to tell people about the grace of God and the power of his Savior. And so he did. He went throughout that town. He even went beyond it and told people how much God had done for him, how much God loved him, and the grace that God had in his life. So even though Jesus was not allowed to stay in that place, the message of forgiveness did stay, and it remained. And people heard it. People were saved. And it remains still today. Now, earlier I told you the story about the time that my friends and I were on The Price is Right. A cool story. I'm sure you have a cool story too, but it's not the greatest story of my life. The greatest story of my life was the greatest miracle that Jesus performed in my life. And it happened even before I could remember. But when I was born into this world, I was a, a sinner. I hated God. I wanted nothing to do with him, and I wanted to push him out of my life. I was lost in sin and the darkness of unbelief. I was condemned. I stood condemned before God. But Jesus came to me, and he reached out to me, and he sent to me his Holy Spirit through the waters of baptism. And in baptism, I was cleansed of my sin, and I was given faith. Faith so that I would know Christ and know his salvation and hold on to him. Jesus Christ did that for me. Cleansed me of my sin. Took this, this filthy, rotten, wretched sinner who had no place before him and he made me an heir of eternal life. So that sinful though I may be, I get to be with Jesus in heaven one day. That's my story. And that's your story. It's a story worth telling and a story worth hearing. Amen.